Welcome to Spacefaring Civilization, or SFC, as we lovingly like to call it. SFC is a place where fan and filmmakers help and support each other to create optimistic science fiction and inspire a better future. Hi, I'm Masood, and today we have a special video where I have a group of wonderful guests as a discussion panel to talk about acting and how to prepare for, act, for an acting role. Before I move on, let me introduce you to my wonderful guests. So these are all wonderful uh, actors from uh, Canberra, Australia, uh, who have played in several of SFC films, original films. First off, Amelia Forsyth smith is a wonderful actress who played a mother <laughs> of a time traveler in, in the talk, an Australian astronaut in the first astronaut, and an aunt to a boy determined to get his father from the moon in the man in the moon. So give it up for Emilia. <laughs> uh, uh, my second guest is Michael Slater, a talented actor who played Bob the alien in Unrequited Fear, Russian cosmonaut in the first astronaut, and an Australian astronaut in the man in the moon. Say hello to Michael Slater. Yay. Hello. <laughs> And uh, finally, but last but not least, John Kelly, who's an awesome actor, who played father to a time traveler in the talk, homeless man in Unrequited Fear, and a space liner host in The Man in the Moon. He's also a co-host of SFC Live. So let's welcome John, yay! <laughs> Thank you all guys for um, joining this first discussion panels. Let's get into it. Let's ask the first questions. And the way we're going to uh, do it is we just discuss it as, you know, if you're on a round table. So the first question is, what is the first thing you do to prepare for your characters when you get the screenplay or the script? So how do you prepare when you get the script? Start by reading the script. <laughs> That's up. a good start. <laughs> Uh, figuring out who you are, where you are, when you are. In, in sci-fi, that's incredibly important, the when. <laughs> yeah, look, just building up from Amelia's point, obviously you want to understand the background of the character so that the words you're interpreting aren't just that particular scene, but what's the what's the background thoughts in that character's head? What mm -hmm. uh, Where does he come from? Where is he going to? What um, What is the motivation, you know, for lack of a... A better term behind that sort of scenario. Look, another thing that helps along with learning the words is obviously to read each sentence and attach an emotion to it. What is the emotional attachment to that particular sentence or phrase? So that will dictate the way you're going to add colour to the way you, you deliver that particular scene or, or the, that sequence of, of words, so to speak. So rather than being just monotone and flat through the whole thing, you've got some color, just like you do a normal conversation. You'll have rises and falls in your voice. You'll have different emphasis because of the way you're trying to uh, emote a particular uh, topic. Good point. I think building on those two, I'd sort of say um, uh, they were really, really good answers, but also um, I would also talk to the director as well uh, with my ideas from reading that script. After all that is uh, talking to them, what do they want? Is this, uh, if they're happy with what I bring to it, um, here's what I'm thinking, that kind of thing as well. Okay. So how much of your own experience do you bring into the character? Or do you bring your own experience? Oh, look, as a, as a spacefaring astronaut, probably plenty. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I yeah. suppose you can, um, I sp you can relate it to perhaps incidents in your own life that, that would bring up that sort of feeling, particularly if it's sort of a, a scene of, of some sort of um, uh, upset or, 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 downturn in someone's life if you've got that sort of experience in yourself you sort of bring that memory back to help deliver that too i'd imagine but and also the joyous times you've had as well which should help um you know bring a, a bit more lightheartedness to a particular uh, scene if that's if that's what's required yeah no good okay great so um generally what are the challenges for preparing for a role and how do you overcome them so what methods do you use to overcome such challenges i'm working with these other two that's been the challenge but um <laughs> if you were going to say it I would so. <laughs> I love working with these guys yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of love 
I know you've also got like theater background. Is is a theater um, type of um, characters, Mona, the, the way you prepare for them, is it different to how you prepare for a screen? I don't, wouldn't say it was different, um, but the delivery is definitely different. A, a theater character is so much larger than a screen character. Um, and I think probably the biggest challenge is finding something that is not usual for you as a person. Like you do attach a lot of your own experiences and your own emotions to a character and then drive down into, into what actually drives the character themselves and create a whole new person. But if it's not usual for you, you've got to go out and find that elsewhere. And, and that is a huge challenge. You've got to do a lot of research. Um, to, so, it, so it comes across as authentic. So you mentioned research. How much research do you do? Especially like something uh, that um, may not be like a, no, a normal uh, kind of existence, like say being an astronaut, like um, um, John <coughs> mentioned. So how do you do research on those that, that type of things? For me, that's someone who overthinks absolutely everything I do, a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> much. Um, but I think that prepares me. I don't know. What about you two? Yeah, look, I think um, if it is a, a, a scenario, maybe uh, the character is in an industry or background you've never had any experience in, it's certainly good to get a broad brush of, of how that industry works, for example. I've um, played uh, roles in the past where I've been... Uh, in a, a career path that I've never ever experienced before, so I've had to sort of understand what what um, what are these people working, what sort of conditions do they work in, and so on, so that I can understand how they would react to a certain situation. So yeah, the research goes back not just to um, what their character is and their their backstory, but also what their um, what their line of work is to uh, you know what their family relationships are or whatever. So yeah, Michael, you had a you had an interesting story about how you did research for the cosmonaut character. In... Yeah, yes, as he was a Russian background, um, I, I think it's really important with playing someone from a different culture uh, to be very respectful. And so I did a lot of research into um, like uh, Russian sense of humor, Russian culture. Um, even background of uh, language uh, um, how, and building a character and I based it off someone I knew that was Russian. So I really wanted to bring uh, a very respectful um, portrayal to it that was realistic and not just um, going with a sort of a, you know, uh, what's the word, like a um, characteristic, I guess, more going more a, of a more believable person. Stereotype is the word I was trying to find. Trying to avoid a typical stereotype and go with a more respectful portrayal of someone was what was my aim. So now we come down, we come to the optimistic science fiction side of this. So how does optimistic science fiction characters differ from other roles that you've played? It depends. I suppose it depends on on how they how well the story is written. But I think ultimately the um, in the two types of science fiction broadly, you've got the optimistic sci-fi, which we uh, we love to deal in, and then, of course, you've got the more more apocalyptic, dystopian sort of genres of, of sci-fi. Those characters in that uh, negative sort of world uh, tend to be a bit more dark, a bit more, a bit more pessimistic, a, a bit more um, anxious and worried, whereas I think the characters you develop in optimistic sci-fi, even if they're going through a downturn situation, will tend to have a more optimistic outlook towards things, be looking a way to go forward rather than trying to survive. So uh, theirs isn't a survival mentality in the character. It's more about their um, how do we how do we make things better? How do we um, grow with this? How do we collaborate? So I think um, you know, I suppose those, those characters wear rose-coloured glasses a lot, and that that's a good thing because that's the sort of optimistic feel you want to generate through the whole theme of the of that genre anyway. So. That's the different, the key differences I see in the characters, and of course they'll have their their, their um, sad moments as well. But uh, ultimately, you see how they work their way out of it, as opposed to just bury themselves into a, a spiral of, of negativity. And that's all I've got to say on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a beauty in being able to create as well. With, with optimistic sci-fi, you can end up with creatures and critters that are, are not of this world and building on what Michael was saying before and in, in his creation of the, the Russian character you still want you need to create those um, not just the character itself but the culture that they've come from and still be respectful to that in a way that is 
positive. Um, it's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. Mm. Yeah. And I think dealing with a positive character, negative character really can show it on your facial expressions too of what you've been through, what your background is. Use that as your motivation as well. It's all in the eyes. All in the eyes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> When it comes to rehearsals, how do you handle changes? So there's often changes in dialogues, even in the last minute uh, before shooting, especially in short films. And I'm sure you've had your experiences in that regard. But how do you handle it? So I know you've like gone through the whole process of rehearsals, getting the dialogue right, and then something changes. How do you handle those things? And what, what methods do you suggest to people? Other than walking off the set. <laughs> Other than walking off the set <laughs> and being a prima donna, yeah. <laughs> uh, look, if, if you've immersed yourself in the character as Amelia and um, and uh, Michael have explored, then really it's 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 not nothing nothing to be afraid of because you, all you're doing is changing your words, the, your intonation, your your character still the same underneath. So it's really just um, adapting to the, to a new script or or um, blocking or scenario, whatever is being changed on you. It's still the same character you've developed in the background, so. Mm. And I think you're used to with all sorts of directions from your director that um, they change last minute. I think it's the same thing. You just, as actors, you get used to change and get used to ad-libbing, going with the flow and doing what um, is recommended and what's the best advice sort of thing. Yeah. As a script writer, like, as a script writer, you're not going to want to hear this, but the words actually don't matter that much. Mm. It's the intent and the emotion that's behind it. And if you mm. can nail that, the words don't mean all that much at all. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good point. Like you said, if you've got the character, um, uh, their, their motivations and, and, and their, um, uh, I guess, relationships, you know, um, solid, then uh, whatever that's built around it, it can change and whatever the character still stays the same. So that's good. I was, I was speaking to uh, actors. She's fairly new to the to the acting world, and uh, her advice with with reading script was: you never go off script. You say exactly what's in the script. Um, where I'd say I'd say yeah, but also you can also bring your own uh, spin to it as well. What because some words aren't won't come out so naturally from you. It's not part of your vocabulary, and um, yeah. that's always something I think you got to check with your director to with any of these changes some directors like Amelia just said it's really um the words don't matter it's it's more the delivery it's the emotion in it and all that sort of stuff but at the same time some directors don't no I want that I want it word for word <laughs> you know so yeah. it's it's worth exploring but also you keep that in the back of your head because you may golf script you may change it slightly yourself just to what you think is going to add more to the scene yeah, the so key is good, to be, be flexible, though, isn't it? You can't you, you, you can't just walk in there and expect everything's going to go exactly as it was planned, and just be be flexible. That's um, that's what the role of an actor is: is to to adapt to to be someone different every second that you're on the set. And filming will always almost take longer than what's on the call sheet. Absolutely, <laughs> don't don't book anything afterwards. <laughs> that's, that is true. That's true. I mean, like that's the reality of uh, filming. Yeah, things. So there's one constant that everything changes, <laughs> and there's a lot of waiting around. <laughs> yeah. One, one especially for said, extras, yeah. and often without catering. <laughs> hey, hey, I, I always cater for my bills. Always. Yeah, look, okay. a well, packet of chips and a bottle of, and bottle of water doesn't cut it, Masood. I'm sorry. Hey, hey. Well, you, you I do chips. have muesli bars. I always have muesli bars. <laughs> you got pizza. I don't know what set you were on. Yeah. Oh, oh right, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Obviously, there's a bit of favoritism go. shown in this cast. <laughs> no, last, last time we had boxes and boxes of pizza. Mm. <laughs> I think there's actually one director on that uh, from Waiting Around that said he doesn't pay his actors to act, he pays them to wait. <laughs> and I think that's a, quite an accurate thing because you, you're, the time you're acting and the time you're waiting are very vastly different. Yeah. So this is a good lead into improvisation. Before we discuss the improvisation side of it, um, so we're gonna we've talked about the methods that you guys use for um, preparing for a character, uh, but obviously, like we discussed, change, changes happen, and then you have to improvise as you go throughout the filming. So we're gonna have a uh, kind of a uh, for the next video. We're gonna I'm gonna invite you guys back 
and we're going to have a, like a, a a play scenario, or, or what do you call it, a, a kind of a, a <laughs> mock-up play. Um, <laughs> and, and then whatever you guys suggest now, um, uh, we'll see how it works out in the play scenario. So those who are watching, learn from it as well. So um, what do you guys suggest for those who are trying to get into acting and, and improvisation is something that they're looking into? Uh, what would you suggest for those uh, actors who are so enthusiastic that they love to be in an optimistic science fiction film? Just so improvisation. Talk about <laughs> improvisation. Go for it and be large. Uh, mm. mm. So say that again. What was that? I said go for it and be large. Go large. Always go mm. large. You can pull large back. I'm trying to build up. Doesn't go large like this. Go large oh, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's that? That, what's that advice going large? What Amelia said. It's for a director's point of view. I think they said it's uh, easier to dial someone down than trying to bring him up. Mm. Is right. that the case of like you know um, getting the character to uh, like a high point? Um, what do you call it? I don't know. I don't know if the exact term, but getting them to uh, like an excited point where they're um, where they're um, uh, where they're uh, overacting things it will feel like overacting but yeah. what comes across on the screen actually comes across a lot more natural more natural it? rather than if you go for something that's very normal and conversational like we're having here it can come across very flat and very mm. dull and a little too much under the radar if that makes sense very true yeah that's always hard re-watching it when you uh, when, when you're re-watching something you've done and you're like oh, i went too dry there i wish i Put a bit more into it, no, and like Melissa, anyway. yeah. <laughs> but it's hard because sometimes you're just like, oh, I wish I did a bit more, but then also I don't want to look overacting and. Hmm. But and that's cheesy. up for the director to decide too. Like Some of them don't tell you either. <laughs> watch, watch the rushes and go. Yeah, no, we need more. We need less. Hmm. Right. Well, so is that what you meant by um, over? Uh, what, uh, sorry, go large. go large. Go large. So uh, exaggerate everything. Basically, is that is that. Almost everything, yeah. Like, not Almost your movements, because that would just be weird. Um, yeah, yeah. You, you, but you, exaggerate, you exaggerate the emotion of, of the, the in, intent. So if you're feeling oh, exasperated, yeah, yeah. you'd be really exasperated as opposed to just yeah. being mildly exasperated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. But that's, that's it with, with becoming a character, because, you know, you're not playing yourself. You, you know, if you were yourself, you wouldn't react that way. So that's always a interesting way to do it. Thank you so much, guys. Um, dear friends, join us again in the next video where we take all this lovely advice we've had from, have from our discussion panel and we're going to implement them in a play scenario in our next video. So join us next video for another SFC discussion panel.